Okay, thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, I know it's a little late, 6.30. We're gonna sit down and do some science. This is great. I really appreciate all of you, um, especially waiting quite a long time for some of you to uh, even join the Streamwatch BATS program. Um, so we have had a, just a little background. Um, I am the Assistant Director of Science and Stewardship I used to run the Streamwatch program. Uh, I started back in 2011 and passed it over to another coordinator um, who has since left. So I'm kind of filling in as the interim coordinator for the moment again. Um, but I do, I did run it for eight years. So I'm like, you know, it's not brand new to me or anything. Um, so eventually, maybe in a few months, we'll get someone else on board and they'll kind of take the reins. Um, but for now, Thank you for joining me. Uh, so our agenda for today, first, we're just gonna go over a little bit of the, the background, the basics of what Streamwatch is, who the Watershed Institute is, where we work, what we do with our data. Um, then we'll get into the biological action team itself. Um, a little bit about stream ecology, a brief intro into macroinvertebrates, um, and then I'll kind of show pictures of how we do our sample collection in preparation for our actual field training day. So tonight I expect it should be like an hour and a half, I would say. Um, tomorrow we'll go over the habitat assessment portion and that's quite a bit more detailed. I would say at least an hour and a half for tomorrow. Um, so there's a lot of information <laughs> that I'm about to just explode onto the screen. And um, don't worry, you know, if you don't catch everything, I'm going to provide this uh, recording um, as well as the slides here to all of you. So you can kind of go back on it and uh, review some of the points we've covered. Um, I would suggest, especially for tomorrow for the habitat assessment, that you do have like a pen and a, and a notepad on hand because um, some note taking might be helpful for the habitat portion. Um, but we'll take a step back. The Watershed Institute, um, I think all of you are kind of familiar with our organization. You've talked to Eve Niedergang, our volunteer coordinator. Um, but our organization has been around since 1949. We used to be called the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association, recently changed our name a few years ago. Um, but our focus is to protect clean water, and healthy habitats here in central New Jersey. And we do that in four different ways. Uh, the first is through conservation. We have a reserve in Pennington, Hopewell. It's about a thousand acres of restored farmland. Um, and we're you know, trying some new things on the property, um, exclosing some areas to deer to see how invasive species populations sort of change without the impact of all of this um, deer herbivory. Um, but we also have 10 miles of trails. So I, if you haven't, I invite you to come on out and uh, take a hike. It's probably a little muddy right now, but bring your boots. Uh, we also have educational programming on the reserve. Our big one every year is our summer camp. We usually have hundreds of kids running around. They're muddy and tired at the end of the day and covered in you know, ticks and poison ivy probably, but it's a, it's a great experience for kids to just roll around in the mud and kind of learn about themselves in the process. Uh, but we also have programs for adults as well, um, night hikes and especially now a lot of, of virtual programming. So you can check those, those programs out as well. Our advocacy team, they work with local municipalities and also at the statewide level to promote stronger environmental regulations. And one important way that they're enabled to do that is through our uh, science programs. So Streamwatch is, is one of our science programs. I am one person. I could not possibly get out to 70 some monitoring sites across central New Jersey. So we really rely on the help of, of you guys, our community scientists to get out there and collect the data. Um, and we will then turn that data, ho 
hopefully into action. Um, we'll give it over to our um, advocacy staff and um, they can take it to municipalities and, and try to prevent development applications from going through um, if we see that there's a negative water quality impact, um, things like that. So really um, science is kind of what boosts up the rest of what we do at the Watershed Institute. Uh, the Streamwatch program itself began back in 1992. Um, we had our chemical action team as the first program that started. And then the biological action team or BATS, which is what you, you all are joining today. Uh, that came a few years later. And we've kind of added on and changed things over the years. Um, what I'm gonna show you tonight is kind of a new iteration of our biological action team. Um, so we're kind of adding another block on this timeline of, of Streamwatch. So currently we have three Streamwatch teams. The first, as I mentioned, is our chemical action team or CATS. And they go out to their assigned stream site every month to monitor some basic parameters of water chemistry, um, temperature, nutrients, pH, dissolved oxygen. Um, and this just helps us to kind of, you know, take the proverbial temperature of our water quality um, across all of our sites to just allow us to track these kind of long-term trends. Our biological action team, are, they're monitoring every spring and fall, and we'll learn a lot more about that today. But this team co collects macroinvertebrates and does a habitat assessment. Um, and we use the population of macroinvertebrates that we find to then calculate a score of general water quality of that site. Now our bacterial action team, they are active only during the warmer months when people are out swimming in the water or kayaking. Uh, we don't want people to get sick when they're having fun splashing around in Carnegie Lake or uh, Petty Lake or wherever. Uh, so we have a team of volunteers who go out every week for 15 weeks in the summertime. They collect samples that we analyze for E. coli and uh, total coliform bacteria back in our lab. Our coverage area, we, we tend to just use the term central New Jersey, but this is a, a more direct, um, our, our more direct focus area. Uh, we have the Millstone watershed in the center, and we've recently expanded towards the west here into the Delaware River watershed as well. Um, and our Streamwatch sites have expanded as well. Um, we now have over 92 samples across our region. Um, some of those have been established using aerial mapping, but we still need uh, some boots on the ground to kind of check them out and make sure they're actually accessible for volunteers. Um, but a lot of these, these new sites are going to be um, in the Delaware River Basin. And just a quick note, um, for you, for your monitoring activities, um, what I will do is look at your address, kind of generally where you live, and try to find a vacant biological site that's closest to you. Um, so everyone here is gonna have to work with a partner. Some of you are working with your family, so you kind of have this existing team, great. And um, for those of you who are joining uh, solo, I'm gonna do a little bit of matchmaking between you guys to, to match you up on a particular site. And then you guys can kind of coordinate with yourselves uh, to, to actually do the monitoring. Um, so when we are choosing these new sites, um, I may ask you to go out to a site that we've never monitored before. Uh, I'll try to make sure that it's accessible for you to get in there. Um, but if you have any issues with any of the sites that we're monitoring, please just shoot me an email and um, hopefully we can do some troubleshooting. We are collecting all of this data, 20 years of data, 29 years of data. So what are we doing with it? Uh, well, first, we are making it accessible to the public through our online mapping on our website. Um, this is an ArcGIS map that we've just color-coded according to 
um, the different conditions going on for various parameters. You'll see um, we have our chemical parameters at the top here in these tabs, and we also have the macroinvertebrates parameters. So you can click on that to view just overall scores of aquatic life, health, or condition in our region. We will also produce quarterly uh, subwater reports for, um, to publish in our quarterly newsletter, The Wellspring. Um, and this kind of takes a closer look at each particular subwatershed um, to, to analyze kind of what's going on specifically, what, what's happening here over the past couple of years, and what we think are some of the, the for some of those water quality changes or um, conditions. And as I mentioned, we will also do use our data for advocacy. So here's just a quick example of, of something that happened relatively recently. Um, this is Cruiser Brook in Montgomery Township. And our stream washer there had been going there for 15 years and all of a sudden found the stream was turning white, just like milky white, um, totally opaque. You know, you could barely see through it, a lot of turbidity. And so we're able to measure that turbidity quantitatively uh, using our chemical test kits. And we're able to use that data to, to go out and, and publicize this issue, to take it to DEP, to take it to um, the entity that was polluting <laughs> that stream um, to, to make some changes. Um, but we also will use it to submit this data to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Um, the DEP is required every two years to put together a report of water quality conditions all across the state, kind of a summary of, of what's going on in, in their water. And in order to do that, they need a lot of data to make a really comprehensive assessment. So they will rely on the help of uh, some organizations around the state who adhere to these really strict high quality standards of data collection. Um, since we're using it for regulatory assessment, we want to make sure that the data is on the up and up, that we're collecting it in the proper way, that we're assessing it in the proper way. And um, one of the ways that we, that we do that is through quality assurance project plans or QUAPs. Um, everything that we'll talk about today is written into this document, the QWAP, and that is submitted to DEP and available to any data users who, who want to use this data they can read this document to see how it was collected and to see if this data sort of fits their own requirements for their use. Um, one of the ways that we ensure that the data we're collecting is done correctly is through rotating field audits. So you will schedule a day to go out with your partner to collect your data. And I, I just ask that you let me know what that date is and I will kind of pop in, uh, not randomly, you know, I'll, I'll let you know ahead of time. And I have a checklist of things that I'm looking for. And I'm gonna share that checklist with you. It's not, uh, you know, a, a test. It, it is a test, but you know, you, I'll give you the answers ahead of time. <laughs> That's the point of this, is to make sure that you know what you're doing and um, that we're collecting good data. Um, in that integrated report, that report DEP puts together every two years, um, this is a look at the aquatic life use data from their 2014 report, or 2016, I think, actually. My number is incorrect in the, in the header. Um, but anyway, so we have a lot of little subwatersheds in central New Jersey that are red, which means that they're not attaining which means that the macroinvertebrate populations are not looking very great. Uh, there's these little pockets of green subwatersheds where uh, we do have a high quality stream as indicated by macroinvertebrate populations. But we also have maybe one or two yellow subwatersheds where there's insufficient data in order to make this assessment. And so it's in those areas across the state that we really are looking to rely on volunteers to help fill in those data gaps. 
Okay, now we'll get into the meat of the biological action team. And I just wanna say, um, I can't really see the chat, but if anyone has any questions, you can put something in the chat and I think it will blink at me, or you can just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask a question. Okay, so our StreamWatch volunteer requirements. I believe our volunteer coordinator, Eve Niedergang, has given you kind of an indication of, of what to expect with StreamWatch. Um, but here are the general expectations for you as a volunteer. Um, first and foremost, it's to keep yourself safe. Um, we're giving you equipment, we're sending you out into the world to collect this data. And just like the conditions could have been this Saturday after a really heavy rainfall on Friday, the water could be running really fast or it could be really, really high. Um, it could be a situation where the bank down into the stream is, has a lot of clay, which means it's just you slip and slide kind of down to the stream. Um, it's really important that you acknowledge all of those risks that are out there and try to just be as careful as you can possibly be. Um, if, if the conditions look unsafe, do not sample. It's as easy as that. No one's gonna get mad at you for not bringing back your data that time. I totally understand. It's field work, that's what happens. And our whole thing with rescheduling the training possibly is kind of indicative of that. Uh, the other thing is to take care of the equipment. Uh, our gear, which it will include our waders, nets, trays, buckets, sieves. Um, some of it's a little pricey. And you know, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, so it, it would be really great if we didn't have to buy a whole bunch of new stuff every year. Um, and that's not been the case. We've had, had really good experiences. So I just wanna keep that going and make sure that everyone is taking care of the equipment and not like dragging it around and I don't know putting holes in your waders. Um, the other thing is that, again, we, we do have limited equipment. Um, so when you request your gear to go out to sample, I just ask that you bring it back as promptly as you can, like within two or three days of sampling. Um, so return that back to the Watershed Institute. So then I can kind of turn it back around and give it back out to the next volunteer. Uh, we also ask that you adhere to the test procedures. Um, you will have instructions given to you when you head out to sample. And so, you know, it's important to follow those instructions. Those are the, those are the um, items that are outlined in our QAP. So we want to make sure that we are following that. Because all of this is such a, it, it's a lot of information. Um, we ask that you volunteer for at least one year. Um, we also are trying to keep data relatively consistent at each of our sites. And so having you out there collecting that data um, more than once in a year or, or even two years, a lot of our volunteers go on far beyond that. Um, it's just really helpful for us to sustain that data. And the last thing is that you are subject to the field audits. Uh, which means, as I mentioned, I'll come out to visit you uh, when you're collecting your data, kind of as a mute observer, although you can ask me questions, of course, if you have any. Uh, but I'm just going to watch you as you collect your data and make sure that you're doing it right. Um, so each volunteer, as I mentioned, is assigned a sampling site. You have a partner to go out um, to collect that data with you. The sampling equipment lives at the watershed center. And so you will contact me to schedule a day and time to come pick up your stuff before you go out to sample. Um, so usually, you know, you would just kind of send an email to your partner and say, hey, I'm thinking this weekend, blah, blah, blah. And you can come pick it up like the Thursday or Friday before, and then um, go out sampling during the weekend and then bring it back the next, you know, Tuesday or, or Wednesday. Um, of course, you don't have to sample just on the weekends, but that tends to be when people go out. Um, once you get the hang of it, the monitoring usually takes between one to two hours. So 
you can kind of expect that long to spend out in the field, um, in addition to uh, any of your transportation time. Um, and so anytime you go out to sample with Streamwatch or anytime you do any sort of volunteering with the Watershed Institute, um, we ask that you visit this form. It's at the watershed.org slash hours. And I'll send that out to you guys. Um, but it's a way for us to track volunteer hours. And oh, is this the, the rectangle? Here, let me move that. That should be better, Bob. OK. Um, so there we go. OK. So yeah, our next sample weekend is coming up. Um, and not a weekend, it's a whole four weeks. Um, it begins on March 27th, which is next weekend, and it goes until April 25th. So you can coordinate with your partner to go out anytime um, during that period. Um, but again, just please let me know when you plan to go out so that um, we can schedule a field audit. Okay. So our biological action team volunteers monitor macroinvertebrate populations and aquatic habitat conditions uh, once a year. So what is a macroinvertebrate? <laughs> um, macroinvertebrates, you can kind of break down the word. Macro means that the organism is large enough to be seen with an eye. So you don't need a microscope or anything to see these, these guys. Um, and invertebrate, means that they are a spineless organism. Um, so you can see uh, uh, the relative size, this is actually quite a large stonefly in this person's hand here, um, but that's kind of at the larger end of, of our macroinvertebrate scale. They tend to be a little bit smaller than that. Um, so our macroinvertebrates, we're focused on one part of their life cycle. And that is the larval or nymphal stage. Um, so I like to show this graphic to kind of show a very quick circle of life. Um, this is a mayfly who is laying, egg. the adult is on the surface of the water. The mayfly is laying eggs that basically hit the bottom of this container and they automatically hatch. And so the, these become larva very, very quickly. And that's a really great adaptation when you're an aquatic organism and there are fish everywhere or other organisms everywhere looking to just have a nice little lunch. If you're an egg, you can't really swim away from anybody. So the mayflies will hatch very quickly into their nymphal stage. But you can see the general difference in size of these organisms when you are uh, collecting these guys, they can be as small as these just freshly hatched nymphs, or they can be as large as the adult is on the surface of the water. There's quite a bit of, of variability in, that, in those sizes. Um, and a lot of times it will depend on the season that we're sampling in. Uh, so in the summertime, for example, that's a, a time when um, just after the spring, when a lot of these adults have laid their eggs and the eggs are hatching. And so there's a lot of really, really tiny organisms swimming around um, in the summertime. Um, and also, you know, in the spring, just before organisms hatch into adulthood, there's a lot of really, really big organisms in the water. Um, so this is, is what it looks like when they go from their nymphal stage to the adult. Um, for most of the organisms that we're looking at, um, they are actually terrestrial organisms, meaning they live on land during their adult phase, but they kind of grow through this, their larval life stage underwater. Um, so they, they lay their eggs, they hatch, they grow, 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 then they crawl to the edge of the stream um, they can be in the stream as nymphs for three or so years. And then they crawl to the edge and they can live for a day as an adult. So it's kind of a, an odd life cycle when you think about it that way. 
So the macro, the diversity of the macroinvertebrate population will tell us a lot about general water quality. Um, and that is because each of these organisms is assigned a value from zero to 10 that we call, uh, we call that our pollution tolerance value. A pollution tolerance value of zero or at the lower end of the spectrum indicates that that organism really cannot withstand any pollution or very, very small amounts of pollution. Um, otherwise they would die off and we would not find them in our samples. Um, so stoneflies and mayflies, um, these are two examples of our very sensitive uh, macroinvertebrates. So if we are finding these guys in our samples, uh, it's kind of looking okay for that stream. Of course, it's more complicated than that, you know. Um, then we have pollution neutral organisms that are kind of in the middle. They can withstand a little bit more pollution, um, uh -huh. but they're just kind of in this middle range. Crayfish and damselfly nymphs are indicative of that. Um, but our pollution tolerant organisms can really live anywhere. And so we tend to find our pollution tolerant organisms um, in animals. Just because they're tolerant of pollution does not mean that they're bad or anything. It just means that they're hardy and they can stick around. Um, but it's when we only find pollution tolerant value or um, pollution tolerant organisms that we can infer that the stream is probably undergoing some sort of pollutant input. What we want to see is a diversity of all of these different types of organisms. So our bats get out there, we collect our water samples, we preserve our macroinvertebrate samples. And what we used to do was the volunteers would take them back into our lab to sort those preserved samples and identify those preserved samples to the family taxonomic level. Um, with this new update, we are getting rid of the last two parts of this and focusing our volunteer efforts on just the collection and preservation. Um, so this really reduces the amount of time that um, you'll need to spend working on your sample. Um, if you were identifying your own, or your own sample, it would be one to two hours in the field. And then another, it has tended to take about six hours in the lab to sort through, to pull out the organisms from the, the sample and then to identify them. Um, that's a long time. And so uh, what we're doing now is relying on an external lab to do that sorting and identification for us, for a price, of course, but um, we're also able with an external lab to get down to a lower level uh, to species and genus rather than family. And um, so that kind of helps us make decisions about water quality. That said, I would highly encourage you to learn more about macroinvertebrates since you'll be collecting them. And um, today we won't necessarily focus on identification, but I think what I'll do is probably another webinar at some point over the next couple months for our biological action team volunteers to really get into the nitty gritty of the identification. So if that's something that really interests you, I would say for now, head to macroinvertebrates.org. Such a great website, really close up pictures of all of the different organisms that, that we'll find in our streams. And um, there's fun little quizzes and stuff to test your identification abilities too. Um, I would say just check that out. And then hopefully we can reconnect in a few months uh, to talk more about identification. All right, so field safety, very important. I said this already, but I'm gonna say it again. If you feel that stream conditions are unsafe, please do not get in the stream and sample. Um, we are focusing on weightable streams, which means that the water is flowing kind of at a moderate rate. It's not rushing like you know, a rapid or anything. And it should be at about, the, the highest it should be is maybe thigh high 
um, stream heights. So if it's much higher than that, I think we'll probably have to find a different site for it or just find a different weekend to sample if it maybe rained the day before. The system, of course, is important. And that is enforced for our biological action team volunteers. You have to go out with a partner, um, not only because the actual sampling methods are much easier with someone else, but because they can call for help. <laughs> if something happens when you're out in the stream, um, you don't want to be by yourself. If you're floating downstream and screaming for help, you want someone to be there to help you. <laughs> um, our macroinvertebrates are preserved stream side with 95% ethanol. So that's the strongest um, concentration of ethanol that we can get. Um, and that's because we're preserving not only the organisms themselves, but we're, we're preserving the entire sample. So we'll stick our net into streams, into um, leaf packs and scrubbing branches and getting down into the stream bottom. We're gonna end up with a lot of twigs and dirt and mud and clay and rocks and everything along with our bugs. Um, so we're gonna use the strongest ethanol that we can because there's going to be a lot of water content left um, in, in that detritus when we preserve it. Um, so, you know, don't drink it. <laughs> it's denatured. It's not going to taste good. Um, and don't get it in your eye or anything, you know, and don't, and don't pour it out at the stream either. We don't want to um, make conditions worse when we go to sample our streams. And then lastly, we want to make sure that we're cleaning and decontaminating all of our sampling equipment before returning it to the watershed center. Um, so that's not, that's not even a COVID related request. This is about species and preventing the transfer of some really invasive tiny, tiny little spore from one stream to another. And I'll go into a little bit more of the details on that. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause here and check the chat, see if there's any questions before we get into the ecology portion. Okay, Nicole asks, how does the ethanol affect the macroinvertebrates? Um, so what we are doing here is we are preserving them, which is a really nice way to say that we're going to pass away in the collection jar. Um, when we preserve them. Um, I know it does not feel good. <laughs> and, and I've probably done this to millions of organisms over my time, um, but it's science and it's just one of those things where we have to preserve it in order to um, take it back and have some quality assurance on that data. If you as a volunteer were to go out to a and do a stream side identification, looking at the bugs and then tossing them back into the stream, we would have no way to check to make sure that that data was correct. And so the preservation really allows for that extra layer of quality assurance. Any other questions before we move on? You can feel free to come in if you do have questions. All right. So now we'll get into the stream morphology. Tomorrow is when we'll focus mostly on, on habitat conditions, but we have to get into a little bit of the habitat tonight in order to understand find these macroinvertebrates in the first place. Um, I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. Are you guys having trouble? Hearing me? Am I breaking up? Okay. All right. I don't know. Hopefully it continues to work. Um, so there are three general morphology types that we find in a stream. The first is a riffle. And in this is green image on the left-hand side. This is our riffle area. It tends to be a little bit shallower. The stream is moving a little bit more quickly. And there are rocks and cobble lining the stream bottom. So that cobble provides habitat for macroinvertebrates to kind of hang on to those rocks or 
kind of hang under the rocks. And because the water is flowing more quickly there, that water is becoming more oxygenated than surrounding areas of stream. So that tends to be where we find most of our organisms. Um, on the other side of that, here on the right side of the screen image, we have pools. So that's where the stream will get a little bit deeper. The water will move a little bit more slowly. Um, the temperature will be a little bit warmer. Um, even in a rocky bottom stream, in pools, you may find more sedimentation and more sand at the bottom of those pools, just more sedimentation is, is building up there. And so there's entirely different groups of organisms that prefer that kind of environment, something like a crayfish, um, which is what we call a sprawler. They kind of hang on the stream bottom and they just walk around. And so they want it to be a little bit slower than a riffle. And a run or a glide, this is kind of that middle section where the stream is moving. It's not a pool. It's not like, you know, there's no movement there. The run is moving, but it's not necessarily a riffle. So it's kind of this intermediate spot. Now I've got an image here that shows these three morphologies in action. Um, in the distance, there's kind of this, this like almost like a dam here where there's like rocks built up here. And beyond here in the, in the far distance, we have a riffle. So we have rocks on the bottom of the stream and the water is going over those rocks, bubbling up a little bit and moving a little bit faster. Um, and I believe we have a riffle here in the foreground as well. Um, so the water is moving within the thalweg, which is the center flow of the stream. It's kind of moving straight over here, if you can follow my cursor. And then it hits this left bank um, where there's, you can kind of see there's a little bit of erosion and then it kind of curves around and goes this way. And, and so waters, you know, it's always going to be kind of moving. And that's going to leave some areas for pools to form. So you can see on the right side of this image here, if you can see my cursor, um, this would be an area that is a pool. And um, you can kind of see there's really no velocity, there's no flow on top. It may be a little bit deeper here. It's moving more slowly, it's warming up here. Um, and then the sections in between, this is where we would, that we would call those sections a run. So it's important to identify those different types of um, morphologies and those types of habitat, because that's going to inform where we go out and use our nets to collect our samples. Um, we have a few different habitat types that exist in these different morphologies. Uh, on the left, cobble and riffles. So cobble um, refers to rocks that are maybe larger than a grape uh, and smaller than a cantaloupe. <laughs> In that range of sizes, um, that's what we would call cobble. So it's kind of these intermediate sized rocks that you can easily pick up. Um, and you can see on this rock to the left, we have these little, little protrusions, kind of looks like gravel just hanging onto this bigger piece of cobble. Well, that's not gravel, those are macroinvertebrates. Um, this type here are caddisflies. And caddisflies are unique in that um, they can secrete this sort of underwater glue and adhere bits of the benthic substrate to their bodies to kind of protect themselves from, from predators. Um, and in some cases, in order to catch food, so they can kind of create a net and, and things can just flow right in there and, and they're all set for dinner. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, snags, uh, which is basically another word for woody debris, um, twigs and branches that have fallen into the stream we give them a chance to break down a little bit. You can kind of see the wood here has these holes, these little nooks and crannies for organisms to climb into. Um, leaf packs are also really great for that. And you might pick up a leaf pack like this and, 
and yeah, you see an organism right on the top here, but there's probably tons of organisms in between each layer of these leaves. Um, so when we're out sampling, I mean, the leaves are gonna be um, a really productive habitat for us. And then on the right, we also have submerged aquatic vegetation. And um, organisms will hang on to this vegetation like this damselfly nymph is doing here. Um, they'll hang on to that vegetation because they're in a moving stream. And so they want to find some sort of stability. You'll find that a lot of these organisms have these adaptations where they are clinging to rocks or clinging to vegetation. Anything that they can cling to is really important in a moving system so they can kind of stick around in the same spot. Um, so submerged aquatic vegetation is a great place for macroinvertebrates to do that, but also um, terrestrial vegetation on the stream bank can kind of hang in to the actual stream water. And even though it's not aquatic vegetation, if it's always submerged, those organisms can definitely cling on to that and um, find a nice little niche there. Um, so any of these places would make for great places to sample. Um, I wanted to go into a little introduction into macroinvertebrate feeding groups to help us understand what these guys eat. Um, and that will help us to understand where we will find them as well. So um, the first feeding group are scrapers. Um, you can think of scrapers kind of like cows, just grazing and like walking along and eating grass, num, 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 you know, they just, they're slow hanging out. Um, there are scrapers on as well. So the image on the right here, this is a water penny beetle larva. And it has this really great exoskeleton that covers its entire backside. It's called a water penny because it kind of looks like a penny on top. Um, but under that shell, it has all of the normal characteristics of, it, of an insect larva, a head, arms, gills. Um, and so it's just kind of grazes along on rocks, munching on biofilm, um, and, it, and it loves to be in riffles because that's where you're gonna find these, these larger rocks to scrape. Um, another feeding group are our shredders. Um, these are the organisms that you'll really find in those leaf packs. They will munch on what we call coarse particulate organic matter or things that are like larger bits of vegetative stuff. So um, leaves or larger kind of twigs, they'll munch it and turn it into that fine particulate organic matter. And so you can see this stonefly is making quick work of this little leaf. We also have two types of collectors. On the top, this is the black fly larva. Um, this is what a type of a collector filterer. So black fly larva have, uh, again, this great adaptation. It kind of exists in, in forests on the bottom of the stream. So they have kind of a sucker on their butt and so they'll adhere to the sediment and they have these like fan-like mouth parts and so they stick their butt on the sediment to stick in one place and they'll just move their, their mouth parts around. And they're filtering the water, any kind of fine particulate organic matter that's floating through that water, they're gonna use those mouth parts to just grab it and, uh, and munch on that. Uh, our collector gatherers, and these are the organisms that will build kind of a net and Again, they're just waiting for that fine particulate organic matter, the things that those stoneflies, those shredders are creating. They're waiting for that to just flow right into um, their net. And we also have predators, of course. So these are organisms that feed on other macroinvertebrates, maybe even small fish. Um, this image here on the right, this is a dragonfly nymph. And the dragonflies are so cool. <laughs> um, damselflies too have, have this feature. They have a lower jaw that can extend out as you're seeing here um, to grab their prey and just to kind of bring it back in and to feed on that. 
Um, so how cool is that? I love it. Um, so in addition to the feeding groups or how, how these organisms feed themselves, we can also look at their locomotion or how these guys will move around. Um, and so we kind of have a description here on the left along with where we would find them in the stream on the right hand side. So we have clingers and crawlers. Clingers are things like that water. They look like they're kind of sucking onto the rock. Crawlers are things like mayflies. They have these like, looks like really buff arms. And so they can kind of walk around on the top of those cobbles too. We'll find those mostly in our riffle habitats. Our climbers are the ones that hang on to vegetation. So we'll find them typically in our woody debris or in our vegetation. Uh, we also have free swimmers. Uh, a, few, um, a lot of the predators tend to be free swimmers because they can just kind of move around and, and find their own prey. Um, so they're, they're just kind of in the water column wherever. Um, on the bottom of the stream, we have sprawlers that are just lounging on the stream bottom. Like I mentioned, the crayfish, um, that's a good example of that. And then we have burrowers that dig down into the sediment. Um, there's, there's some sorts of uh, mayflies that have little tusks on the end of their head so they can kind of like burrow down into the sediment like that. Um, we also have things like the black flies or worms that kind of, you know, worm their way down into the sediment. So there is a lot more that goes into physical and habitat monitoring that we'll cover tomorrow. Um, things like looking at the benthic substrate, um, which is basically what is on the bottom of the stream. Is it sandy? Is it rocky? Is it muddy? Um, is there a lot of leaf pack? Things like that. Um, we're looking at depth flow regimes. So we want four different types of that. The depth can be either uh, deep or shallow and the flow can be either fast or slow. So we want to find areas of the stream that are fast and shallow, fast and deep, slow and shallow, slow and deep, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we'll get into the details of all of this tomorrow. And that will also really help us uh, when we actually get out into the field to find where these macroinvertebrates are living. Um, but first, just wanna throw these pictures out here and now I can't see any of you because when I have your video up on the screen, it kind of blocks the PowerPoint, I think. Um, but we have two different types of streams represented here. One on the left kind of has a sandy bottom. You see a bit of erosion there on the left bank. And the one on the right has more variability in those stream morphologies. So I was asking which stream likely has more macroinvertebrate diversity I mean, probably the stream on the right-hand side. Um, we want to see variability. We want to see diversity. The stream on the left here has a pretty uniform depth. There's no little nooks and crannies in the stream. Um, there's no overhanging vegetation, really. There's no um, woody debris in the stream. There's nowhere for organisms to live unless they're burrowing down into the sediment on the left-hand side. The right hand side, however, we have different microhabitats that are available to organisms. We have riffles for those organisms that are hanging onto rocks. We have the pools in the for, for those guys that like the slower moving water. Um, that's gonna that tends to be where we'll find more of our, our diversity. That's what we would call a more productive stream. Okay. So to get into macroinvertebrate sampling, I was thinking that I would show a quick video. Um, usually we would be out in the field and we would do this in real life. <laughs> um, but for our purposes, I'm gonna show this video from, I think it's from the Minnesota um, Pollution Control Agency. It's only two minutes and kind of goes over some of the basics and then we'll come back and talk about it. So next thing there. Okay, 
Now, can you guys see this screen? Yeah. No, I just see a blank gray box. Oh yeah, okay, okay, good. Thank you for saying that. All right, let me stop my share. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, stop share, please. So my Zoom is now not responding. <laughs> so just give me a moment. <laughs> Okay. Serves me right for trying to switch screens. All right, I think we're good. As part of its biological monitoring program, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency helps assess the health of Minnesota's surface waters by sampling and studying aquatic invertebrates. These include insect larvae, crayfish, snails, small clams, and leeches. The presence and numbers of different invertebrate species provide information on the condition of a given stream or river. Certain species are more sensitive to changes in water temperature and chemistry, stream flow, or sediments while other species are more tolerant to changes in their environment. This makes invertebrates useful water quality indicators. Uh, invertebrates have tolerance values that are associated with them that um, for each individual invertebrate um, that indicate its sensitivity. to Conductivity is 248. Biologists have certain expectations for what range of species they should find at a given sampling location. If what they find differs too much from expectations, the location could be considered impaired. If we do find an impairment, we'll actually come back to the site within a year, um, try to resample it, and as I mentioned, try to, try to kind of hone in and figure out what, what's actually um, driving or what could potentially be causing the, the difference that we're seeing. In, in the past, the MPCA relied heavily on chemical criteria as its monitoring tool to assess aquatic life and water quality. But over the years, the degradation of Minnesota's waters can be attributed to a wide range of sources that cannot be effectively monitored by measuring water chemistry alone. Biological information gives us more of a moving picture of what's going on within a system, whereas the chemical information is really good information, um, but it's really just giving us a snapshot in time. And so using that information in concert with the biological information, we can really get a a good perspective of what's going on within, within a particular stream ecosystem. At each sampling location, biologists collect at least 20 samples from a variety of habitats, like overhanging or submerged wood, aquatic plants, and rocky or sandy stream beds. Samples are sent to a lab where the invertebrates are identified and tallied. But it's giving us a good picture um, of where potential problem areas are and where potentially exceptional areas are. For more information on this and other monitoring efforts, visit the MPCA's website and search biological monitoring. All right. So I, I like that video because during this voiceover, um, 
they're they're showing a lot of really great collection activity. You can kind of see them shaking um, the vegetation into the net. You can see them picking up the rocks and kind of like pull, pushing stuff off. Um, and you can see them sorting it into a different container at the end, sieving off water, things like that. Um, so um, it kind of gives you an indication of, of the physicality of it when we'll actually get out into the field. Um, but now I'm going to go over more of the theory of it. So I'll kind of explain how we do it. Um, and hopefully these pictures will help us to understand this well. Okay. Okay, so when we're deciding where to sample, the first thing that we need to do is to identify the habitat types that are present. So we're gonna look at the site, check out, is there fine woody debris? Are there submerged logs, larger bits of wood? Um, do we have cobble in those, in those riffle areas? Do we have coarse gravel or sand? Vegetation, leaf packs, boulders, anything. We're going to check off what we find, and then we're going to estimate kind of how much of that stream consists of each of these different habitat types. So for example, if we're looking at a stream, we usually assess streams on 100 meter stretches, which is a little more than 300 feet. We'll look at that entire stretch and say, okay, half of this is maybe riffle and 25%, we've got woody debris and 25% of this stream is vegetated. Um, and so we'll split up our samples among those different habitat types in the same way. So in that example, um, we would split half of our 20 samples, um, put 10 at the riffle if 50% is riffle, we would put five each at our woody debris and vegetation in that case. Um, so don't get too bogged down with trying to find exact percentages. It's kind of a ridiculous thing to ask <laughs> and to assess in a real scientific way. Um, but essentially what this is asking you is which habitats are here that are the most productive and you wanna focus your efforts in those habitats but also maybe grab a couple samples at the, the least, the less productive habitats. Um, so riffles are gonna be the best spots we really wanna focus on. Um, woody debris and vegetation, also really, really high up there. Undercut banks, these are sections on the side of the stream where kind of under the water surface, we have a bit of, of the bank that's been eaten away. And we could have um, exposed tree roots down there, um, really kind of like branchy roots um, from vegetate from herbaceous vegetation and things like that. And that's going to provide really great habitat for organisms. So we also want to focus on those undercut banks, kind of scrape on the underside um, to try to capture any organisms that are hiding in there. I would say the lowest. Um, end of the spectrum here of productivity is uh, just sediment. So if you go out to a stream and it looks like when I showed the two streams side by side, the one that has a lot of diversity, and then the one that was just sand or, or silt, just kind of mud on the bottom of the stream, um, you're gonna have a lot less uh, productivity in sediment. So this is kind of the order of operations. If you have a lot of riffles, you wanna focus there. Um, so because of that, I'm going to go over our riffle sampling procedures first. Uh, you are going to be using a D-net, and that is named because we have a flat bottom of the net, and then it's kind of shaped like a D above that, kind of rounded up. So you want that flat bottom to be flat with the stream bottom as well. Um, in this center picture, we have smaller bits of cobble here. You can kind of pick those up and, and scrub them into your net or maybe even kind of put them in your net to kind of anchor your net down. Um, and you want to make sure that the open part of your net is facing toward the stream flow. So the water is flowing right into your net um, and that's gonna help you to capture 
these macroinvertebrates. Once you have your DNAT flat on the surface, um, then you're going to pick up those rocks within one square foot. So the DNAT is one, one foot on, on the base. So we're just kind of kind of imagine it out into one square foot, pick up all the rocks in that area and kind of put them into the net and scrub them. We want all of those clinging bugs on the rocks to end up in our net. So we wanna scrub them really well. Some programs will use um, brushes to kind of really get into the rocks. We don't, I, I kind of feel like that ruins the specimens for some of them. Um, so you just make sure that you really pluck them off and, and really get them good with your hands. After you clear the section of larger rocks, then you're going to kick into the substrate for 45 seconds to a minute. And so that's going to get those remaining organisms that are hanging in and around the cobble itself. And then also the organisms that are burrowing a little bit deeper. So that's going to get our burrowers, our sprawlers, even um, some free swimmers. Um, this process is just kind of in, in the net is open in the water for up to a minute. And um, we're hoping to get all of our one square foot sample bugs into the net during that process. For vegetation and woody debris, the sampling procedure is a little bit different. So um, the, the video we watched had, had a great example of this. But you're going to stick your net into the aquatic vegetation. You can kind of jab at it like you saw in the video. You can massage the vegetation, kind of zhuzh it into your net to get the bugs in there. And then after you do that, you can jab, massage, then you sweep. So in the water column, you might have, have like freed some of these organisms that are clinging on the vegetation. You want to make sure you sweep that net through the water column to get those organisms in your net. For woody debris, you're going to do more of a scrape. So you can kind of scrape the underside of logs, even use your hands to just kind of like massage the log um, and get any organisms off and into the net as well. But these are the things that we'll get practice with when we go out in the field. Now, after we collect our sample, again, we're doing 20 of those jabs or kicks. After each jab or kick, we're going to empty our sample into a bucket. We don't want to lose any of our sample with, with our next jab or kick. Then we, we'll have a sieve. It could be a sieve bucket or just a, a gold sieve like we have in the image on the right hand side. Um, we're going to sieve out the water from our sample and replace that water with our 95% ethanol. And we'll store our sample in a jar, kind of like this one. Uh, he's in, in this example, he sieved out his water. We have the detritus left behind, all the bugs are in there. Scrape it into this jar and then fill this jar with ethanol. Make sure we label it really, really well fill out our data sheet, and that is the procedure. So any questions on actual um, monitoring activities, how we do monitoring? Okay. Now for equipment decontamination, there are a number of invasive species, both vegetation and animal. <laughs> Um, so we have a new invasive species up in the Muskinetcong River, and we want to keep it to the Muskinetcong River. We don't want to bring it down into the Millstone or into the Delaware. Um, so that's the New Zealand mud snail. And these guys are super duper duper small. Um, for a lot of these examples, you're going to carry invasive species, just cells, like little bits of clumps of vegetation or, or you know, spores or whatever, um, you're not going to be able to see it. And so the way that we need to clean this stuff off of our gear is to do a process called check, clean, and dry. Um, so the first step is to, pull, is to check and pull all the stuff that is visible off of the net, out of the net. You can rinse it in the, in the stream water itself. Um, Make sure there's no 
bits kind of hanging on, on anything. And then we'll go into cleaning and we'll, we'll cover this process when we're out in the field. But basically what we'll do is we have a bucket, we'll fill it with the stream water itself um, and put a soap in there. We use Alkanox and it gets really foamy. And you know, it kind of seems counterintuitive to use the water um, from the stream that could have the invasive species to do your cleaning. But the act of adding soap to it is going to burst those cells. So it, it does end up working as long as your water is soapy enough. Um, and so you kind of stick your, your boot in there. We do have a scrub brush to really get it on your boots, scrub your waders, um, scrub your net heads. Um, and then we want to make sure that everything is super dry. Um, so one, besides cleaning, another way um, to make sure that we're not spreading invasive species is to let the equipment dry uh, completely in between different streams. So if you are sampling somewhere and you're not going out for another week, if you leave your net and waders and gear in a sunny place where it can dry out completely and be dry for 72 hours, that's, that's also fine, that's okay. Um, another way to do it is to put your stuff in the freezer and that will bust those cells open as well. But um, who has a freezer large enough to want to put a pair of waders in there? So after you collect your sample, you do your habitat assessment, you're going to have some stuff. What do you do with that? You wanna make sure that you've completed your data sheet in its entirety before you leave the stream site. Um, then you'll have a chain of custody form. And that is basically to allow us to track where this macroinvertebrate sample has been. Um, so we know if there's any issues with it, we know who to contact to, to get some answers. <laughs> and then uh, we wanna make sure that we return all of our equipment that we've borrowed. In addition to the completed data sheets, and our preserved sample jars to the watershed center uh, within a couple days after monitoring. Now, what do I do with your sample after you drop it off? I will send it to Norman Doe, uh, which is a laboratory uh, about an hour and a half west of us in Stowe, Pennsylvania, and their staff will do the sorting for us and the taxa identification to the lowest available taxa, which is usually um, species or genus. And then Norman Doe will return their identification results along with a macroinvertebrate population score back to me so we can kind of assess what the condition is in our stream. In New Jersey, we have a few different habitat types. These are the physiographic provinces of New Jersey. And you can kind of see I like to say it's like the Route 1 corridor right in the middle here. So west of that, it's a little bit rockier. It's a little bit more mountainous. Um, the Piedmont less so, and then it gets more and more so in the highlands and then valley and ridge. And then the opposite is true uh, east of Route 1. We have the coastal plain, so it's sandier. It's less rocky. Um, the Pinelands are here in the outer coastal plain, and that is like you know, an, an ecoregion totally of itself. Because these areas are so different, we also analyze our macroinvertebrate samples from these areas differently as well. Um, so our watershed area is in central New Jersey, about here, we're kind of split in half by the split between high gradient and coastal plain. So we will use both of these indices, um, depending on where your site is located you could be in the high gradient area, or you could be in the low gradient area or the coastal plain area. Um, so this is like probably too much information, but th this is how those, those indices are calculated. Um, of course, the idea of health, you know, our, our ideal condition is gonna look different in high gradient areas compared to a low gradient area. So in a high gradient area, we wanna see a lot of scrapers. This is one of one of the end, one of the metrics that we're looking at. Scrapers are indicative of lots of riffles, and that's something that we definitely want in a high gradient area. And we're also looking at just the total number of, of genera. 
um, the total number of organisms, we call them the TALU attribute um, two or three genera. These are just organisms that we really want <laughs> in high gradient streams. In coastal plain streams, we're looking more at clingers. So the clingers are those that hang onto vegetation. Rocks are gonna be more common in high gradient. So we wanna see those organisms that hang onto rocks. Vegetation is gonna be more common in our coastal plain area. So we wanna see more of those clingers. And so it's these small differences in metrics that lead to us using these different indices for um, different ecoregions. Okay, well, that is it for tonight. I just want to pop in, see if there's any questions. Hi, Erin. Yes. Um, I have a question. When we're collecting um, the samples and, you know, we're kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, like messing around with the, with the, um, like the greenery on the sides of the banks and things uh -huh. like that. Is there anything that's dangerous in there that we need to watch out for? Interesting question. So I, I think that poison ivy is, is a super duper common uh, plant and it's native and like, you know, so it's gonna just thrive around um, stream ecosystems and in wetlands as well. Um, so we want to make sure we're not rubbing our hands all in poison or ivy oils. <laughs> um, I, maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll add a, a slide to show kind of what poison ivy looks like so we know to avoid it. And generally, it's leaves of three, and really it's leaflets of three, um, let it be. Or hairy rope, don't be a dope. Because <laughs> there's ropes of poison ivy that can kind of climb trees and they look a little bit hairy on them. Um, other than that, there could be uh, animals hanging out in that vegetation, something like a, a snake or something like that. But um, if you announce your presence as you're walking over there, so I, I tend to do that. I will walk over the side and be like, hello, snakes, I am coming to sample here. And they leave me alone. Um, also, I have a question when we're when we're handling um, the organisms, are we? Can we wear gloves, or do you have to, you know, be freehand? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I I will do it without any gloves, but you can certainly wear gloves. And I think we have a stock of like rubber gloves that maybe go up your forearm a little bit. So um, if you don't want to touch the stuff, you certainly don't have to. Thank you. <laughs> But the, the, the organisms themselves, um, some of them do have like crazy jaws, like the dragonfly, um, but they're so small that they're not going to hurt you. Um, like they can't bite you, you know? Okay. This would be a great test for me because I have a, a slight uh, phobia. <laughs> not a massive one, but a slight one. And so I think sure. I'm being very brave <laughs> doing this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it'll be fun. I think you'll find it <laughs> cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> My son will be very proud of me. <laughs> yeah, nice. Eric, Erin, for folks that might be interested in learning the identifications, will there be any opportunity to do that in the program? Yeah, so I, I am kind of the, the program is still in flux. I, I've kind of redesigned it over the last month, actually, to switch over to just doing um, the external lab identification. And so I was thinking that it, it could be in during the fall sample this year, we could transition to um, volunteer identified samples. So we'll, we'll do one like official external lab sample and one sample per year where volunteers will do their own uh, identifications. And so in, in advance of that, we would definitely schedule uh, some more training for identification. Thank you. Do you think that would be, would you guys be interested in that? Or I mean, it's a, it's a lot to learn for identification. You guys, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I certainly, I would be, but I can't speak for others. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, I, th I think, I think that sounds good. Erin, even though we are sending it to the lab, can we spend some time streamside sorting through just for fun? Of course. 
are you kidding? Yeah. Yeah, get, get up close and personal. Get a look at these guys. But don't develop too strong of a relationship with them individually. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has, has anyone ever had trouble finding organisms? Like, I mean, besides maybe because their stream is bad, but I mean, is it difficult? <laughs> I wouldn't, I, I think we, we have ha certainly had that problem because streams are, are low quality. Like mm -hmm. it, when it's just worms, you know, that's not great. But um, no, I, I, I have not had that experience. I think they're, they're pretty easy to find. And most people tend to be shocked actually at, at how prolific they are. They're, they're everywhere and they're just so small that you just don't see them. Um, a follow-up question, Erin. Um, yeah. I've done some of the sampling in the past and occasionally we ran into like eels and tadpoles. Can we throw those guys back in? Absolutely. Anything that has a vertebrae, we do not want to, to preserve. Salamanders, fish, yeah, tadpoles, anything like that. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Bob, I think you're on mute. There's How about that? Can you hear no, me? There now? you go. Oh, it says mute, which to me means I'm off as yeah, opposed to. So oh, this thing is backwards. No wonder I was having difficulty. <laughs> Language problem. Any, anyway, <laughs> what's the average time? Uh, that you feel is adequate. Now, obviously each situation is different. We may want to stay there all day, I don't know. But uh, normally a couple hours, is that what you think is average? Yeah, I, I would say starting out, the habitat assessment will take quite a bit longer right. than you might expect. So starting out, it might take two and a half hours or so. But as you become more comfortable with it over time, I think you could get it down to two or one hour even. Because we'll be in the same the same stream or water, so we'll get to know it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are gonna adopt a site. Um, I, I kind of wanna keep you at, at one spot rather than shuffle everyone around. And so, yeah, that kind of helps you to get to know that one site really well. Erin, how often are we are we meant to be uh, going to the site? I didn't catch that. So we have our sampling period coming up starting next weekend and going to April 25th. So we've got a four week period here in the spring. Um, and this, and I, I think the confusion is because I am also confused. I was kind of like wondering how we should run it in the fall. I think what we'll end up doing is having a second session in the fall. I can I can send you guys that schedule. I do have the four weeks picked out. And so it would be one sample in the spring, one in the fall, but the fall sample, we would do the identification ourselves rather than sending it out to a lab. And that can be optional if you don't want to do the identification portion, we just wouldn't do it and that's totally fine. Is the habitat so, assessment just done once a year? The habitat assessment will be done every time you collect a sample. Okay. Adelaide, so, did you have a second? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if I'm being a bit silly, but no, no. so within, within that month, we're only going out to the site once. Is Correct. that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. I thought it was a lot more. Yeah, no, it's just it's just once. And I'm and I try to give four weeks so that there's some flexibility. You know, you guys are volunteers, so. You have other things that you're doing. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it also helps us to spread out the equipment as well. Okay, thank you. Sure. But in the fall, if we do our own identifications, then that time burden would be a little bit more. So in addition to the two-ish hours in the field, we would also schedule a day in person maybe? I don't know. Um, in the lab at the Watershed Center where we would process the samples and identify them. And so that can, that can take a while. Sometimes we do that over several sessions because your eyes start to bug out. <laughs> um, but you're like looking for these tiny organisms in um, your sample and then you pull them out to identify them and it can get really um, exhausting. So it can be up to six hours for that part. Um, I have a question about that, Erin. Um, yeah. do, you, do you ever worry, like if you're collecting samples one day and sorting them the next day, do you worry about the carnivores eating any of your 
cool, guys. I do worry about that when we do when I'm we're doing stream side identifications. So if we put our crayfish in with mayflies in one container, you're basically just saying, go at it, crayfish. Um, but with the way that we're doing it, we're preserving them right off the bat. That tends to be less of an of an issue. Any other questions for tonight? Okay. Well, thank you again for uh, we can we can text you or email you directly, right? After oh yeah, yeah. Did Eve uh, send you guys my my cell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can text or, or email or anything if you have any questions. Um, and then so tomorrow we'll meet at the same time, 6:30. I think it'll take about the same amount of time, maybe a few minutes longer. Um, and then I will finalize our information for uh, our actual field training day and send that information out as well. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night.